Good morning. How's it going, everyone? Hope everyone's having a wonderful GDC so far. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So uh, I'm happy to be here. I hope uh, all of you are happy to be here. Um, not only am um, I happy to be here just because it's GDC, and it's, uh, it's the first GDC in a couple years. Um, so that's cool. I'm also very happy that we have a video game releasing this week. It's called uh, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. So that's pretty cool. Um, before we get started, I've been told to ask the crowd a few questions. <laughs> uh, if everybody can like move to the center. Uh, it looks like everybody's fine. Is everybody fine? <laughs> everybody looks good. OK, uh, turn off your phones and any noise-making devices that you might have. Uh, remember to not record any of this, because uh, that's illegal. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sweet. All right. So uh, this is going to be a talk all about uh, Wonderlands, but don't worry, I'm not going to spoil anything. There's mainly going to be talk about the audio systems in the game and stuff like that. Um, and mostly we're going to cover loot is the main topic and how in audio we kind of like make the loot special in our own uh, specific way. Um, so yes, yeah, shout out to everybody at Gearbox. I wouldn't be here, you know. Uh, <laughs> there are so many incredible, uh, talented people on our team and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for all the amazingly uh, smart, talented, and hardworking people that pour their hearts and souls into everything we do. Um, so yeah, big shout out to them. Um, so who, who am I? I am Joshua Davidson. I'm lead sound designer at Gearbox Software. I was born and raised in Macon, Georgia. I graduated full sail in 2007 with an associate's degree in recording arts. I started my career in video games back in 2007 at Volition Inc. Um, I worked on Saints Row 2 and Red Faction Guerrilla while I was there. I did a little bit of music composition on Red Faction Guerrilla. Um, not a whole lot, but it was a fun experience. Um, I started working at Gearbox in 2009, uh, exactly two years after I started my job at Volition. And the sound design team at that time in 2009 was just Mark Petty, Rayson Varner, and myself. Uh, I spent about a month or two uh, helping them finish Borderlands 1. Um, I mainly finished off some bugs and stuff like that on Borderlands 1 and like went straight into work on the DLCs. Um, so Borderlands is kind of known for those the, the, the long-winded DLCs and that was a really cool experience to just have that quick turnaround uh, cycle of like working on a project for like a month or two and then pushing it out. Like we were, we were working very, very fast back then. Um, so yeah, in between 2009 and 2010, uh, this is what the audio team was. It was uh, Mark Petty as an audio director, Rayson Varner, audio lead and composer, um, Andrew Cheney uh, was an audio lead too, and uh, I was the young sound designer. <laughs> um, we were in this old building in Plano. This is the old building that we were in between 2009 to 2015. Um, those audio offices were kind of makeshift audio op uh, offices. They weren't really designed to be audio offices because it was like in a bank. <laughs> so we just put audio panels all around the rooms and tried to make our best with it. Um, but in 2015, we had an op opportunity. We had this opportunity to build uh, an actual game development studio from the ground up. And that was really cool because it means we can make you know, an audio facility from the ground up and actually really, really think about how we want our audio facility to uh, operate. So this is like a, just a little diagram. That little sloppily drawn circle that I did right there is where all the audio offices are. Um, there are six control rooms in, right there. And we have a live room and um, um, we also have a, a VO room as well. Um, so the construction of it began in uh, like 2000, like middle of 2015 or so for the audio offices, and these are kind of like what what those prelim preliminary like shots of them were looking like before we uh, finished construction on them. And uh, as, as we go through, you'll start to see the the shape of the offices start to come together. This is one of the control rooms, and now we got the desk in there. We got the um, monitor mounted on the wall. Um, uh, you can see 
On the sides there, there's a, the acoustic foam batting um, that goes inside the walls. So if you actually touch the walls, you'll feel like this kind of foam inside of it. Um, and then we have this like other layer that, of cloth that we put over the top of that. And then that just kind of helps with the sound more and also makes it aesthetic. So um, yeah, and this is when we started to get more of the equipment in. And this is the final uh, look of the office, basically. So like I said before, we have six control rooms. One is a Dolby Atmos room. Uh, now, it, it eventually evolved into that uh, around 2019. Um, as we were kind of finishing up Borderlands 3, we, we got pretty hardcore about making sure that we are game supported at most. Um, the, cold, the control rooms themselves are powered by Yamaha Nuage, which runs on the Dante network. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that. Um, but basically, the Dante network allows us to be able to have every room network to one, one from one to another. So you can set up a microphone in one room and then record in any room you want, really. Like you can re record from control room run one to control room six, you know, it's a, and vice versa. Uh, so it's a really flexible facility that we have. And from 2015 to 2020, we all came to this facility to work every work day. And then the pandemic happened. So yeah, we were all there when the pandemic changed everything. And uh, Gearbox went fully remote, as did a lot of uh, game developers, and uh, as a lot of different jobs in the world became fully remote. And you know, things changed very quickly. Luckily for us, we had shipped Borderlands 3 already. <laughs> We'd already got that out the door. Um, so that was about six months prior. Um, we were making good progress on the DLCs, but um, still, this and this was a drastic change, and a lot of people had to make adjustments. And and while we were also adjusting, Gearbox was looking to grow in size. And 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 uh, despite that pandemic, excuse me, uh, despite the pandemic happening, we did a lot of hiring, and uh, we did a lot of really interesting things between the start of the pandemic and now. In fact, that's what I'm about to show you today. <laughs> um, so. Um, so yeah, we started hiring quite a bit. So this is the audio crew in 2022 in Frisco, Texas. Um, the Texas, uh, Frisco, Texas is headquarters for Gearbox right now. So we have Mark Betty, he's our head of audio. Um, and now we have a sound design branch. And um, so the sound designers are basically the sole content creators for the sound design in our games. And um, so we have staff that are just completely dedicated towards that now. We also now have tech sound designers. So our tech sound design team is basically, they're in charge of creating audio systems and um, head, uh, like spearheading implementation. They work on things like occlusion and in-game uh, DSP systems, such as you know, in-world convolution reverb. They also help uh, the sound designers get temporary audio hooked up to the various gameplay systems in our games. Um, so yeah, they, they have a pretty big task and um, we, we also have audio code that helps uh, us create the tools that we all end up utilizing. Um, we also have a uh, VO design now. Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, they, there's a lot of voice in our games and uh, it's got to get recorded, edited, organized, and processed. And um, we also have an in-house in composer, Joshua Caro, and we have a producer, Nate Randall, that basically helps us keep everything organized and stay <laughs> in, you know, on task and everything like that. And we also have audio QA, um, an audio QA lead that helps us track down issues and bugs. and He's, he's very knowledgeable about all these Borderlands systems. He's been on our team for over a decade, too. So he kind of can speak our language and so forth. He's a very valuable member of the team. Um, but that's not it. We have a sister studio. We have Gearbox Studio Quebec. Um, and we have staff there. And they've been working on um, certain different aspects of Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. Like, we, we pretty much let them kind of operate autonomously, but we we have check-ins and we talk with them a lot to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so that's 21 audio staff. Um, and remember, a few slides ago, there were only four. <laughs> so we've come a long way since 2009, 2010. Um, so yeah, let's get to the fun stuff now. So now, a couple years back, my colleague Brian Fieser uh, was going to come to this GDC and do a talk on the modular weapon system for Borderlands 3. Uh, it's a system that he really pushed for after we hired him in the 2016, and while it took a ton of effort to work within this modular system, it greatly paid off, uh, and we are extremely proud of it. And over the next few slides, I'll give you a slight overview of the benefits we got out of that system. So in previous Borderlands uh, games, we were limited by memory and scope with how many weapons we could 
uh, design and use with our weapon system. Like on Borderlands 2 was a lot more rudimentary. Um, on Borderlands 3, we had more memory, we had more staff, and uh, we had a bigger overall scope for the project. So we decided to build a system that would allow for pl placing sounds on individual gun parts um, um, uh, in our in-house tool. It's known as the, G the Gestalt system, basically. And it basically creates a module approach that could strengthen variety and sonic character considerably. Um, the catch, though, is <laughs> it requires a lot of content to be made. And for example, uh, the total asset count for all of the gunshots in Borderlands 3 ended up about 5,500 individual gun session, gunshot sounds. And for a comparison, we shipped about uh, five, uh, 250 individual gun sounds in Borderlands 2. So uh, it was a quite, a, quite a huge leap in scope and content creation uh, that had to fall onto the team. And um, I think we did a pretty cool job. Um, so yeah, this is actually like a, this is what the Gestalt system looks like. Uh, just from the editor perspective, as you can see, there's this is a Mali, or excuse me, this is a Hyperion shotgun, and you can select all these different types of parts and make all sorts of different kind of configurations for just this one manufacturer specific weapon. Um, and every weapon in the game basically um, uh, has has a system attached to it. Now. This is the, uh, the debug menu in game that we can access as developers. This allows us to basically build any configuration we want. Like in this example, I'm selecting parts for an uncommon Maliwan sniper rifle. Uh, I can make a very specific configuration if I want in this menu, or I could just select like from a wide variety of parts and let the system create a bunch of random Maliwan sniper rifles within the part selections that I've chosen basically. So on the next sl slide, I'm gonna show uh, examples of two Jacobs pistols and two Jacobs assault rifles. They're the same gun, but listen to how the two pistols sound different from one another and the two assault rifles sound different from one another. If it will work. And here comes the assault rifle. So yeah, sometimes with this system you can get very drastically different sounding configurations between the same types of guns. Um, and sometimes they'll feel a little more subtly different depending on you know, the weapon. Uh, but either way, we achieved something we hadn't in our games before, and that was something we were very proud of. If you play our games, like maybe a certain one coming out this week, uh, maybe check out two of the same weapons in your inventory and notice how they might sound different from one another. Oh, oops, I skipped that. So if you wanted a deeper dive on just the um, Borderlands 3 weapon system, um, you can take a, uh, like a, a picture of this slide. Um, I did about a 10 minute video um, kind of breaking down how I made the sounds for the Mali 1 sniper rifles and also how that uh, how it like basically um, worked within the framework of the Borderlands 3 weapon system, essentially. So now we're jumping forward to today. Uh, over the next few slides, I'll show you how we approached uh, to moving to the, uh, moving from the sound of Borderlands uh, 3 to uh, Wonderlands uh, into the world of fantasy, essentially. So the Borderlands aesthetic uh, we were used to has normally been wildly varied between the organic and the synthetic, combining themes of like Western, sci-fi, and there's always been like a little bit of a dash of a fantasy element in Borderlands. I, I always say to people that Borderlands never really gets old to work on because as a sound designer, uh, the world is so very interesting and varied. It doesn't feel like you're ever doing the same thing at all on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so Wonderlands actually presented us with a new aesthetic challenge to dive deep into the high fantasy aspect and really focus on cultivating a Borderlandsy take on magic systems and melee weapons. Um, there were also some noticeable design changes that influenced our aesthetic choices. We had a, a, quite a few new systems being added to the game, um, in addition to some overhauls of the previous systems we were working with. And a lot of these big design overhauls influenced the aesthetic we were aiming for. So to amp up the fantasy theme, we did sort of a remix of the Borderlands 3 weapon system by adding crossbow barrels and behaviors to familiar Borderlands franchises and weapons manufacturers. Uh, grenades were also replaced by spells, and they have some really cool behaviors, and I'll 
cover those in a little bit more depth later because there, <laughs> there's a lot to those. Um, we also deepened our melee mechanics by adding um, melee weapons as a form of loot in the game. So the, the melee weapon system uh, kind of piggybacks on the uh, modular um, gun system, essentially. So as Wonderlands was spinning up on pre-production, we were still in the midst of Borderlands 3 DLC production. So at the time, we were a bit short on resources to kind of get the jump start on um, Wonderlands that we needed. Um, our associate director of sound design, Brian Fieser, had worked with Paul Stoughton in the past, and we contracted him to see, or contacted him to see if he would want to do some contract work with us. Um, Stoughton, I don't know if you know Paul Stoughton, but he is an industry veteran with amazing talent and a reputation for creating and releasing his own very high quality professional sound libraries under his company, Penguin Grenade. Um, we we tasked him with the ability with the with helping us basically like create our own personal sound libraries um, uh, for our team to use once everyone rolled off of the DLC and straight into production of Waterlands. We requested a, a highly organic library of raw, processed, and designed content. Um, having this content for our designers to work with would help ensure that our designers were uh, utilizing the same palette of material in their work, so we could have a, we could all like have a really nice uh, cohesion to our Magic audio. So the raw source material mainly consisted of recordings of organic material that had been cleaned up for us to use and put into SoundMiner. So, um, so in the next slide, I'll play like various examples of what that raw source material is um, using like a, a, a few different type elemental types. Let's see here. So uh, uh, once we had that raw source, but we would move on and, and process that source. So uh, the process source basically takes the raw source that was recorded and adds some heavier processing to it. So this stuff uh, was intended to be uh, designed and used as a magic layer for our designers. Um, but you know, it, it, gave, it basically allows the designers to have a lot of wiggle room to have their own forms of creative expression with it. And finally, there's design source. We didn't do a whole lot of pre-design source because all, pretty much all of this work happened before a lot of the art and design had, had been created in the game. So it was kind of like more, it's, it was kind of like more audio concept art is what I kind of think of it as. Uh, either way, it, it became pretty useful stuff 
in the end anyway. And it, it, it really kind of got everyone inspired and in thinking about like what the, the real sound of Wonderland's magic and was gonna be. So here's some examples of that. So now that we've uh, uh, covered the aesthetic aspects of Wonderlands, over the next few slides, we'll talk about how we expanded our modular systems from Borderlands 3. So on Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, we, did, we wanted to take that modularity a step further. Um, we had that, we kept our existing modular system for the guns, but then we also added modular functionality to other, other aspects of the games. Most notably, uh, that was the spell casting and the uh, melee weapons. Uh, the cool thing about Borderland, the Borderlands 3 system is when it came to our new magic guns and our crossbow weapons, we had a system we knew already would mostly just work. Um, outside of the some of the new, outside of that, we just had some new RT PCs that we needed uh, in Wise, and after that, it was the biggest challenge really was nailing down how we wanted the things to sound. So for the cross barrel, uh, crossbow barrels, we had a challenge. We wanted them to sound punchy and pretty satisfying to shoot, kind of like any other Borderlands weapon in the game, but we needed it to also have this kind of like old school kind of medieval crossbow sounding aesthetic. Um, it took a decent amount of experimentation uh, with the content, but we figured out if we figured if we replaced sounds from certain parts on the other guns from Borderlands 3, but kept some key choice layers, we could keep the familiar signature brand identity for our weapons, but also make them feel you know fresh and unique. Um, so yeah, a good example would be the Torg weapons. We kept some of those mechanical, bombastic, thumpy sounds that you would t typically know, uh, notice in a Torg weapon, but we added some more of that medieval ballista kind of uh, aspect to the aesthetic of that sound. So snappy releases, satisfying projectile whooshes, um, and here's a video medley of, of some of those crossbow uh, weapons to kind of give you an idea of what we ended up going with. Uh, we also had magic weapons in the game. So for magic we weapons, we also removed a lot of those like uh, native Borderlands 3 layers and kept some choice layers for supplementation. So for example, like a dull, a dull assault rifle might keep some of those mechanical Call of Duty kind of sounding elements and 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 the reload sounds so they could stay uniquely to doll, to doll. but we added new layers uh, to added to represent like the new magical content. And we kept focus primarily on the weapon's elemental magic properties and crafted those transient entails around those elements. Uh, and we also kept that design language just kind of familiar for, with those uh, weapon manuf manufacturers. So uh, this next slide will uh, show you some of the cool magic weapons we worked on. Poison reloads so much. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so yeah, melee weapons uh, presented an entirely new challenge, and we didn't have a system for anything like this yet, so we kind of got to dreaming up one. Uh, I knew that we would want to continue our philosophy of adding audio to specific types of parts, but I wasn't exactly sure how going into it. Uh, there are basically four main types of melee weapons in the game, and each of those four categories has three subtypes. Um, underneath those. And, and this is what those look like. So this is blade type one. Uh, it's a one-handed sword. And those are examples of the three different types of subtypes that go underneath that. Uh, this is blade type two. It's a two-handed sword. And this is a, a pre-textured version of those uh, subtypes. I promise they look a lot better now. Um, and then there's blade type three. These are blunts. Um, so very handed to to um, two-handed weapons. And those are the three subtypes for those. And the last one is the one-handed ax um, and the three subtypes in that family. So we thought that um, these could require a lot of content and we're always cautious about these kind of things because more content means more audio and more audio <laughs> usually means more things get loaded into memory. And Wonderlands is also releasing on last gen consoles. Uh, so we have to be very mindful and about that delicate a balance to the approach there. Um, we played around with a procedural whoosh and loop system first, and the video on the next slide is a, um, a very interesting prototype of that um, using the tone generator in WISE. <laughs> So yeah, that, that file name is we, weeu.mp4, <laughs> very appropriately, appropriately named. Uh, so there were successes and some drawbacks to that loop system, and I think we could have gotten there with more time and extra code support, but those resources were kind of limited at the time, so we decided to instead just create a one-shot system for the swings. And on the next slide, I'll show you uh, an example of how that comes to, uh, all comes together basically with um, uh, a blunt weapon. So yeah, they, they were they were all broken out into different types of categories, and those whooshes are very dull for the main subtype, but it gets more interesting when we add things like the shing layer or the spice layer. So the, the shing layer is basically the layer that a subtype inherits, and each subtype has its own unique shing layer. And each subtype also sometimes has its own, well, we, I don't know why we called it this, but the spice layer. Um, we, we, we realized that sometimes just the main whoosh and the shing layer sounded just too literal. Like, it, yeah, it sounded like a me melee weapon you know, swinging, but it wasn't very cinematic or interesting. So we, we would add another layer on top of that just to kind of at, make it feel bigger and more impactful as you swung it. So here's an example of all those layers combined um, and some of them, you know, soloed and then combined rather, excuse me. So now we'll add the unique uh, shing layer for that subtype there. And that's just the shing layer soloed. And this is the spice layer just soloed. And this is all the layers, including uh, a cryo ele elemental loop layer. So these all come together just to make this one unique specific variation of um, uh, sonic identity. So we basically use, utilize melee impacts in a similar way. Each parent category had an impact sound as associated with it. So if you're using a blunt weapon, a blunt weapon is going to have a unique impact just for the blunt weapon, you know. Um, and we we kind of we we didn't want to add too many you know too much uh, unique file names or anything to the uh, um, to the system because we you know memory is a very delicate thing. So we just kind of instead of making an impact sound for each type of you know. Um, 
material like grass or concrete or you know glass or something like that. We basically just created hard and soft um, generic impact sounds, and then we layered on, on top of those our existing generic bucket of sounds that we use for uh, material impacts, essentially. Um, so yeah, that's what we uh, did for those. And uh, this, is, this next slide will show off some of the gameplay utilizing the systems men mentioned previously with uh, just the one-handed uh, axe weapon, essentially. <laughs> The skeletons are fun to kill. Um, so spells, these are actually my favorite. I like them a ton. <laughs> uh, I don't really miss grenades at all, and I think if you play uh, Wonderlands, you'll probably feel the same way. Uh, but the spells are also extremely modular, but their core component can be kind of broken down into a few main high-level categories. Um, that's That would be casting, projectiles, and spell mods. And casting is very varied. Um, this is the, all the different types of casting that it can occur. Um, so without going into too much detail, <laughs> uh, absent from this list are a bunch of the uniques, which are like the legendaries and stuff like that. Um, but I don't want to spoil those. <laughs> um, so there are, there are different types of buildups, loops, and casts that can be performed. For example, like you may have a, a spell that casts a magical elemental missile via, via wand, or you may see a spell that casts fireballs from a, the player's hands. Um, some types of spells can instantly cast. And while some can, can just uh, uh, like uh, be held down and then let go and then you can cast it that way. Uh, the casting times can also change based on the timing of the, uh, they, it can change timing based on a player's like skill or the rarity of the, of the spell itself. Um, all these variables come together in the system to create a lot of variety and interesting dynamics that can change basically the moment to moment gameplay um, and play styles up quite a lot. Um, a lot of these projectiles also that come from, from these spells, uh, uh, basically we're able to reuse the main spell magic missiles audio, audio um, because the magic missiles were basically us utilizing all the different types of elemental um, sounds from, from all the other uh, aspects of the game. So every now and then we would need something bespoke like um, like there's a meteor spell, so we would need a meteor sound for that, or we, or like an elemental hawk or dragon would fly out, so we would need to put some uh, some bespoke creature sounds on those and stuff. Um, yeah, and then there's the last pillar of all the spells are basically the spell mods, and that that's basically like a sm a small way in which a spell can have its behavior changed. So sometimes they would spawn additional projectiles, and those projectiles could share the same audio. Uh, but more often you would like get new projectiles, like a whole new giant meter, meteor falling from the sky or a gravity well, or like, which is kind of like a sing singularity. Um, so the next, uh, the next slide will show off a lot of those uh, spells that we have in the game. one's my favorite for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so some final some final thoughts here. So as you can see, we've done a lot to expand uh, the modularity in the Borderlands universe in Wonderlands. 
And it's a game based on loot. And these modular systems add, in our opinion, a, a great deal of value to the fundamental core gameplay loop. Um, basically by cr increasing sonic variety while also being very practical because we're simply piggybacking on the, you know, the variable nature of the gameplay design in our games. Um, we added a lot of interesting new ideas and content to Wonderlands and I'm excited to see where things get taken in the future. Um, and I hope you all uh, pick it up at some point and enjoy the amazing hard work our entire team did uh, making all this come together. Uh, so big shout out to everyone on the audio team back at Gearbox. Um, they are incredible people and, and they have so much collective and extraordinary talent. Uh, you just heard a lot of the work that they did and I'm super proud of them. And uh, thank you all for coming. I guess we can do Q and A because we got still a little bit of time. Um, if anybody wants to ask any questions or anything, Carson. Yes. How much changing? So the audio concept art that you made for the individual stories for each of four areas. Did you find that some of those like really fit well, or you had to change them a lot? Um, actually, the, we didn't do a whole. Uh, the question was how uh, how how useful was the audio concept art? Oh, by the way, there's a microphone over there. I just realized <laughs> I'm new to this. Um, yeah, uh, the question was how 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 much did the audio concept art change, and how much did it actually work out? Um, it actually worked out pretty well. The only thing that we we mainly just um, we mainly just uh, prototyped casting sounds because we knew that we were going to need those. And really all that those needed was just like a little bit of timing adjustments here and there. But that, that, that was about it. But we didn't do a whole lot of that because, you know, it would have been a huge investment just to not know if it was going to pan out. But some, most of it did, yeah. Uh, there's a microphone there and a line there. So if you want to ask a question, yeah. What's up? Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, with the modular system, I'm guessing it means that s some weapons can have a ton of voices playing every time they do their thing. Um, did you have any constraints related to that? And what are techniques you maybe used to reduce the voice impact of having this modular system? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the modular system, it's not like, you know, we have a lot of parts to choose from to put sounds on. But we didn't use all the parts, you know. Um, we like, for example, on Borderlands Three, uh, each gun type each gun type has three different types of barrels, and each barrel has three uh, subtypes uh, called barrel mods. Kind of just kind of like how the melee wep or the melee weapons had three subtypes. So we would basically kind of piggyback on that, and we would also put sounds on like the muzzle. Uh, and like uh, the grip and a few other parts. So generally at, at one time, what's, what's usually happening is like you're hearing about five to six uh, different sounds playing on top of each other at the same time. Uh, but it rarely goes more than that unless there's some specific e like edge case, which there probably is because there's so many different types of guns. So, but um, we test it all the time. And so we're, we usually don't find too many crazy edge cases like that, but yeah, it can happen. For sure. That's a good question. Thanks. Hello, name's Owen. Um, I would like you to kind of like if you can go more into like the modular philosophy and more about that, like, because I understand you know, with sound designing, you want to you know add more layers that you're doing to kind of create more distinction between different sounds. But what is that modular philosophy that you're talking about? If you can go more in detail about that. Um, just like the sound design philosophy for them, like like what sound do we put on what part? Like yeah, yeah that kind of thing. So yeah, like. Uh, Typically, like um, for, you know, it, it, each sound designer kind of approaches it a little bit differently. Um, but like um, a lot of us put like, for example, on the muzzle, that's where we kind of choose what tail sound plays. Mm. Yeah, and like for the grip, like we'll have a different type of transient crack for that. And so we'll give each one of those parts like its own family of sounds. And we kind of, uh, you know, we, we approach it differently for every type of weapon. I did a lot of the work on the Maliwan sniper rifles, for example, and I would just kind of find families of sounds that felt good for certain parts and kind of go from there. And, you know, like when I, when I first started working on this modular system, uh, it was Brian Fieser who kind of spearheaded the whole development of it. And I got to admit, I started working on the Maliwan SMGs and they just sounded like trash for like an entire month. And it really took me taking a break from 
the Maliwans SMGs. And then I started working on the Maliwan sniper rifles. And I just kind of had that fresh perspective, you know, and like I would I would make like some pretty cool like synth punch layers and stuff like that, like laser pews, you know, and stuff. And I would put them on I would give a, a certain part a family of pews and then some some parts would get more of a body like a bo um, bottom low end layer and stuff like that. So, so, so with the philosophy is more like ex exploring the feeling of the sound and allow yourself to the time to kind of like create that. Similar, like similar families of sounds that we're probably married again. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, and cool. Thank you so very, much. Thank yeah, you. yeah, absolutely. Hi, uh, I was just curious about the procedural exploration that you did with like the Wise Tone Generator, and what eventually led you to abandon using that on this project, and whether you think it's feasible that you might use it for this purpose on future projects. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the the looping system, it, it was mainly uh, d we just didn't have like the the we didn't at the time our our, our code staff were um, kind of ramping up on kind of some other engine side work stuff. So we didn't really have um, the code support that we needed to get that done at that time. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of why we ended up abandoning abandoning it. Um, we we were like. I'm not exactly sure. We were kind of we were really in the thick of development at that time. So adding like really really brand new features was like risky. So we just kind of had to and kind of that's why we kind of stuck with what we knew, you know, and just kind of stuck with like the one shot method, you know. And that ended up working out well, but yeah, and I think in the future uh something like much more, you know, cuz like what's cool about like a looping system is you can get away with like doing a very little amount of content and get a lot of mileage out of it. You know, like I've, I've seen some really cool systems from some games, you know, that can utilize Foley that way, essentially, you know, like just with a few loops, like you can have, you know, you, with a like one six second loop, essentially, you could probably like do a whole game's worth of audio with that, you know, but that's, that's like a whole, whole nother, hopefully we'll, we'll have like a, a GDC talk on something like that in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hi. Uh, jumping back to the whole modular approach of weapons, how do you make sure that things aren't clashing in a weird way? For instance, like you have some transients on something and some body or spice or the tails. How do you make sure that it all kind of amalgamates into a good sounding thing rather than like random stuff going? Yeah, the, 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 the trick there is to like not put, you know, just be very choiceful uh, in your decisions on like what parts you use. Uh, try not to use every part for a family of guns. Um, like I kind of mentioned before, like just use barrels, barrel mods. Like, and the same thing happened with uh, the melee. The melee stuff. Like we, we really, when you're swinging a melee weapon, there's usually not going to be more than three or four sounds, and they're all whooshes. You know, so they're they kind of naturally blend together, um, and it just takes a little bit of experimentation just to make sure like they're you know. You know, in the frequency spectrum sense of things, that they all kind of like fit their own fit fit in their own frequency space. Essentially, like that's why the shings are kind of just like a very resonant. That are kind of like a resonant spike, essentially, and you know the whooshes are more dull and more low mid. You know, and then like the spicy layers are kind of like, you know, a little bit. They, you hear a little bit more higher frequencies with those. The kind of that kind of sells more the wind, the wind whooshes, and the like the 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 passage of air going through the weapon. Essentially, I think. Okay, so you're so you're kind of assigning more throughout the frequency spectrum to the different modular parts of the gun to make sure that there's no. Yeah, and we I I, I kind of showed like that debug window that we have in our game and that allows us to really 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 test it thoroughly like and it also allows us to kind of really see how random things can get <laughs> and so you can just like spawn a, a thousand you know uh, variations of that particular type of weapon and that can enable you to just really pick them all up and play with them and see if you're going to get any weird things cool. but after a while we we you know, at first I was when I like I, like I was saying with the Malawan SMGs on Borderlands Three, I was everything sounded like a mess because I didn't know what I was do, doing with this system for a while. But really, I think um, just having the the right amount of layers and just knowing how to design them, it just takes time working with the system and like um, everybody who everybody who's worked with the system, all of our sound designers that have come up, the new the, the new guys and stuff like 
they're extremely intimidated by the system and it you know but it, it and that's very understandable but once you've it, it really it really takes a little bit of lead time work like to really get used to working in it and like it takes a couple months sometimes to just to really get a good feel for it because it's pretty complex for sure cool thank you mm -hmm. hello well first of all i'm sorry i have a couple of questions but i'll try to keep them really quick uh so in creating of um a gun sound do you start with natural uh, guns sometimes or you prefer to start everything synthetic in terms of taking a real gun and recording it just because it might be more natural and maybe there are some sounds that would keep it more um as a better clue however maybe over exaggerating would be better in general so what what is your approach to creating uh this type of uh, yeah sound? yeah my, my experience mainly working in the system uh, for the guns uh, specifically is like um, I, I mainly worked on Maliwan weapons, um, and I'm a big synth nerd, so that's kind of where I feel most comfortable, you know, naturally. Um, so I kind of, um, on Borderlands 3, I, we had a lot of pre-production time where, um, like, uh, my, my colleague Rayson Varner and I, we were using Serum like crazy and just constantly making patches with it. And I, I was making a lot of synth patches with Serum and learning to design my own laser sounds, like laser pews and things like that. And um, so I, I started personally with the synthetic stuff, but you can't just use that, you know, because like uh, using just the synthesizer or raw synthesizer sound is going to sound completely awkward in the game um, because that's not how a real gun would sound in real life. You, I always like to layer in like real weapons and kind of dirty it up with saturation and stuff to kind of pull back that really clean, clean sound that a synth can have, especially a software synth like Serum. It's very, very clean. Um, so you kind of have to find, you know, unique ways to dirty it up a little bit and make it feel yeah. a little more So fresh. do you put sometimes the real sound into the sampler in the Serum itself and then start using uh, some of the algorithms there like... Uh, uh, the, the, wave, the wave tables? Yeah, in the wave in the wave tables, do you use it or you just uh, do it separately? Uh, I have used I have used my own custom wave tables, but I've done them more as like uh, just an experiment. I didn't do that with Fair gun enough. sounds though, but that that's a cool idea for sure. Okay, well, uh, another quick uh, question. So about the recording processes, um, I assume that in the beginning when you started it, it was probably more difficult because you needed to in both cases you needed to have a studio and a good environment. What was the regular problem with recording and did you have to i mean you probably have to fix some of the sounds and clean them up what were you doing with this for example if you recorded a sound but there's some background noise or some frequencies picking up that are not natural to the sound Do yeah so like when it came to prefer to re-record it yeah we uh we actually enlisted some outsourcing partners to help us get like recordings of guns we also recorded guns ourselves and mm -hmm. and and got those files cleaned up um so yeah, that's pretty much what we did with that. We also, <laughs> this is actually a pretty funny story, but well, and this is a very Texas story if you've ever heard a Texas story, but um, we we uh, sent out an email to the team um, a asking, hey, who wants to record some guns and gun foley and stuff like that? And so um, this was probably like in 2017 or something like that. And it was just a blast to the whole company. and. I think we got like 50 emails back or something like that. Yeah, I got a gun. Let's record it, you know. And so we we invited people to our Foley room, and and basically we created this giant like library of of Foley sounds mm -hmm. uh, for the reloads and things like that, just simply based on all the people at Gearbox that seem to have guns. Uh, some of them have quite an arsenal, which is impressive. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Brought them to the office. Yeah, probably shouldn't tell people that. Um, yeah, but yeah. Um, another question. Uh, the deadlines in, in a company, how long and do they change through the time? Because you started with a smaller team and probably when the company grows, the deadlines and it becomes more strict. However, the more there are layers in the processes, the more something could go wrong. How often do you deal with situations when you need to produce the sound or uh, deliver the sound in a really short time? Do you prefer to be more creative or go with a more safer approach of reusing most of the sounds and just adding something uh, to that to make it more unique? Um, I mean, that's that's different uh, depending on what, it's, it's different depending on what phase of the project you're in. Like if you're in pre-production, you have, you have time to do, like we're getting more disciplined with this over time, like you were saying, like, uh, Gearbox is getting bigger. We have to kind of like uh, process orient things a little bit more. So like doing pre-production now is like, um, 
We will work on design documents. We'll work on prototypes. We'll work on mock-ups and things like that for a, sp for a, a particular type of design feature that's coming down the pipe. We'll get a, get as much of like high level stuff done very early on, but we, we can't, we have, we'll have to revisit that later whenever the design actually gets implemented into the game. So there's like a stagger process now, but, and that's always changing for sure. Okay. And what's the most common problem you have to face with everything? All right. This is be the last question because you got a oh, big line behind you, buddy. Sorry. Uh, then never mind. Don't, don't. <laughs> okay. You're good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, you're good. Hi. Yeah, I was curious about the, uh, you mentioned there were some new real-time parameter controls you used. I was wondering if any of that uh, you, you would consider played a part in your modular system. Um, I know you scrapped the procedural tone generator, but I was curious if there was any procedural kind of real-time parameter control or if all of that was baked in. Yeah, like the, the, the RTPCs that we created for these are basically like, things that help change the timing of the weapon, depending on the variable rate of speed that it's being swung at, which can happen with the loot, basically. So our tech sound designer, Jesse Lemons, was pretty much primarily the guy that set that up. But So I'm not exactly sure what the exact parameters were, but they basically could change the rate of time and pitch to kind of like affect the parameter based on how you know, what the, what the loot swings at, what time it swings at, because, you know, in Borderlands, you can level up your character and sometimes that'll change the way you swing things or how, how, you know, how, you know, how fast it goes and things like that. So we have RTPCs that kind of like, um, piggyback on that basically. Okay. Yeah. So that, did that affect the layering? Cause it seems like a lot of the modularity was about the layering. Um, it, it did on the guns. Um, okay. so the guns like, uh, Typically, whenever we're working with guns, sometimes like you'll want to change the volume of a layer um, based on something that some parameter that you want, like that's hap that you want to control. So, like if you have a higher rate of speed, or like if you have um, here's a good one, like if, if whenever you're getting low on ammo, for example, we have an RTPC that kind of like starts to duck certain layers and bring more mechanical layers up. So, like you'll hear that. Ch -ch 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 and then you'll hear that, you know, it, it cues the player in essentially to, oh, I'm running low on ammo. So we have like a lot of little RTPCs that do those kind of small little detailed kind of things. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hi. Just a quick question about the, um, the raw processing stage that you mentioned that you did with your uh, library. How much manual work was involved with that? Did you do much sort of editing between the different types or was it more just batch processing? Um, so we pretty much for that whole library setup, uh, Paul Stoughton, he's, he's the guy that was behind that. He recorded a lot of that stuff himself and then uh, also spent the time like, you know, doing the RX treatment on it and basically cleaning it up. And we would divide all those things out into folders by elemental type. Each elemental type folder had a raw a uh, uh, folder full of just random things like that, like the bed sheets tearing or you know ice crackling and things like that. And then they would each have that process folder as well with the more the more uh, interesting like you know effects added to those to the raw source and stuff. And then the design folder usually didn't have that much stuff on it because like I, I was saying earlier, it's pretty much just it was kind of more used as a concept kind of uh, phase. Did I did that answer your question at all? Uh, I think so. So the processed. Um, stage was that mostly just effects or it wasn't sort of any sort of like actual editing together of different no uh, uh, not really uh, it would it would be mostly just cool editing like uh, I know Stoughton likes to use um, traveler like so for a lot of those like those whooshes that he make he would actually take the um, he showed he showed me how he did it but he basically would like take the raw source and then just kind of he he could make really cool transients out of the raw source and sometimes yeah he would layer things just to kind of beef them up a little bit because yeah you've probably heard some of those probably had a little bit more a lot more body you know than the raw source did so he would use traveler to kind of get those really dynamic whooshes he i know he uses actually this by the same company you know the uh, the it's called Woosh, <laughs> a Tonstrom Woosh. I think it's, it's, I don't know how you say Tonstrom. Is it Tonstrom? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, he would use that a lot. And and so he, he would take that pro, uh, raw source and then make some cool, interesting things out of it that could be useful for our, our other sound designers to kind of like pick through and layer and things like that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, I was wondering, um, with a team of 21 sound designers and all making modular layers that have different purposes for different guns, and you're all using the same like source library that is custom made, 
was there some kind of agreed upon signal chain or mixing mastering chain at the end of the process for individual layers, like certain DB that you're like aiming for, or was there like certain plugins where like everyone were using this compressor at the end of the chain or I don't know? Uh, no, no, not at all. Actually, we don't, we don't really uh, mandate that our sound designers do anything very, very, we're not that process oriented. Um, we definitely have certain like pillars and style guides that, that we want them to reference, but whatever tools our sound designers want to use, we let them do it. And we don't really have any specific like set requirements because we, because we kind of feel like that kind of limits the creativity a little bit too much. And we also don't have, we don't have that many people actually working on the modular stuff, you know, it's usually like a four or five people or at most, you know? So it's a little bit easier to kind of like see where everybody is. It's not like everybody's just throwing stuff at the system. It's only like a few of us pretty much doing it at one time. And all we're right. all reviewing each other's work and stuff, so. All right, perfect, that's the answer I wanted to get. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Hi, um, going off of that question, um, once all the audio is implemented, um, when you are mixing and mastering, is this only in WISE or are there iterative sessions where your sound designers start mixing in the DAW, they do it in WISE and then there's one? Yeah, all the content is created in the DAW and then all the in-game aspects are mixed in WISE. So we hook WISE up live to the game and we do the mixing there. And um, we, we also, like when it comes to the actual mix down of the game, we, uh, we go to the office. So we actually spent uh, a lot of December at the office mixing the game and we all sit in the room together um, a few of us sit in a room together and kind of participate. And uh, we're in the Dolby Atmos room at our studio, essentially. And um, yeah, uh, so we all kind of like sit there, we we mix it, we find what, what levels we like it to sit at, and just kind of all vibe together and kind of come to a consensus on something, yeah. Okay, and uh, is it separate for stereo mixes and surround sound mixes? Or do, can is there uh, like mix down that can naturally be? I was could, sorry, could you say that again? I just couldn't hear it. Um, for people who have those surround sound uh, you know, speakers at home versus stereo, are those two separate mixes you send out? Oh, no. Oh, uh, no. Um, uh, we basically, most of the files in our game are going to be mono, but for weapons, we typically do stereo. And f like whenever it comes to mixing in Dolby Atmos, um, we do very, cho very, very, very choice scenes to really highlight the Dolby Atmos experience. Um, I can't, I can't, I don't want to spoil anything, but there are some <laughs> in the game that we purposely mixed to make, you know, pretty big sounding in Dolby Atmos. Um, we work with Dolby and they, you know, they, they kind of help us out a little bit with that. But really the, the game itself, like most of the assets in our game are either mono or stereo. Um, and like if you have a surround sound set up at your house, basically the game engine kind of gives you a lot of stuff for free because it's all 3D audio and like, you know, the 3D audio just kind of gets baked into what we're doing already in the game with setting attenuation values and things like that. And there's there's usually, whenever we want to really, really accentuate um, like a, the surround sound, we do it very, very deliberately for a very particular type of asset that we think will get noticed, but it's it's a little bit less common for sure. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have about three minutes. Hello, thank you for mm -hmm. coming here and talking. Um, does, there, does the modular system change the approach that you take when sort of designing the more synthetic sounds and how so? Yeah, um, it, 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 it totally does because usually, you know, it, it, mm. You know, be it, like whenever I was working on the modular system, it just I, I hated it at first because I I missed just being able to just make the sound in my DAW and hope it and just make it sound good in the DAW and then put it in the game and make tweaks from there. But um, yeah, like uh, it, it was it's really it was really tough. You have to kind of make things that don't sound as great in the DAW when you're working in the system. You have to kind of make something that sounds like a layer of something that you would make. And then you would have to put it in, in Wise and then put it in the engine. And then you would have to test it against all the other layers that you're doing. Um, so the approach basically, you start to make things a lot more piecemeal that way. So you'll make like a transient layer or you'll make, a, you'll make mechanical layers or 
Like you'll have layers that are like with the Mali one sniper rifles that are just more synthetic or a layer that might be more uh, meant to be more like your low end thump or something like that. And then it, it takes a lot of experimentation, but you know, it's, a, it's extremely rewarding when you get it working right finally. But yeah, it, 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 every sound designer kind of approaches it in their own unique way for sure. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you may have actually answered this question already when you said that all the content was created in a DAW, but I was wondering if if any of the synthesis, like the like the shock synth source and the, the sweetener layer for the crits came from Unreal's built-in synthesis rather than from a plugin. Uh, no, we have not been using uh, Unreal's uh, built-in synthesis, synthesis at all. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, pretty much a lot of the stuff that we do is either, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's like a tool that we use that's playing live in the background, it's usually like um, like convolution reverb is a big example of that. Like we use that. F we we have a whole. I can do a whole another talk on Triton, which is our you know our, our occlusion and reverb system in the game, and we have you know we have like compressors and limiters and things like that that run in the background via wise. But uh, in these games, we have we a lot of the synthesis that you're hearing is was created in a DAW, printed, and then made into a WAV file essentially. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Hey, thank y'all so much for coming. It is we 11:49. We did it. We did it. <laughs> uh, we're having uh, if you all have additional questions, we're having a lunchtime surgeries thing. I forgot what room it's in. It's a, a few rooms down. Uh, yeah, what was it? 3014. Yeah, three, uh, 3014, it's going to be myself, some other sound designers uh, or sound people in the industry. Uh, we're going to be chilling at tables, you know, having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. So if you all want to come to that, that's uh, just right down there, the 3014.